Hello and welcome everyone to our monthly lecture series titled Encountering Life, jointly organized by the Department of Religious Study and Ariel Graduate Council and sponsored by the Institute for the Study of Humanistic Buddhism, University of West. My name is Miro Sake, Chair of Department of Religious Study. Now, before we begin, I would like to request our President of the University of West, Dr. Minhua Ta, to say a few words. Good evening or good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the lecture series um, by Dr. Lancaster, as always. Uh, very nice to see all of you. Um, today, I just want to uh, say some, let everyone know that on um, Dr. Lancaster's birthday is tomorrow. <laughs> um, so I just want all of you to wish Dr. Lancaster a very happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, President Tan. <clears throat> and uh, today, once, once again, I, it is my pleasure, great pleasure and honor to introduce our distinguished guest speaker, Professor Louis Lancaster. And Dr. Lancaster is Emeritus Professor of the Department of East Asian Languages at the University of California, Berkeley, and University of West. And the topic of today's lecture is reincarnation, body and sp spirit. Buddhists believe in life after death because the Buddha taught that human beings are each born an infinite number of time, unless they achieve nirvana. In today's talk, Dr. Lancaster will be offering a fresh perspective on reincarnation and will explain why do Buddhists believe in life after death. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Lancaster. Thank you very much, uh, Maroj and President Ta. Thank you all for the greetings on my birthday tomorrow. <laughs> um, hard to believe for me, but I'll be 89 in a few hours. <laughs> so it's good to be with you. The, the importance of the idea of reincarnation was brought home to me one afternoon in a Sherpa village near Mount Everest. Uh, the village had a small Buddhist temple, and it contained Tibetan texts. So when I asked to look at the texts, uh, the guardian of the temple said they were being kept for the Lama and were not available to others. So I asked if I could meet the Lama, <clears throat> expecting to hear that he was on a trip and away, which I often heard. In this, instead, the person said, you can. He's just over there in that house. And he pointed to it nearby. I walked over and was greeted by a woman holding a young child. They were both very beautiful and their resemblance noticeable. Well, as you may guess, the child in her arm was the Lama. She explained, looking at the boy with a mix of pride, reverence, and sadness. This Lama has come to me, she said, and I must care for him until he is ready to be trained again. She was aware that by the time he was five or six, he would be taken from her to live his life as a Lama. Well, the villagers gathered round us out of interest and they told of how their Lama had grown old and passed away. After his death, they began to look for his reincarnation. It was no surprise that this child attracted their attention. He was bright-eyed, serene, and special in appearance. Thinking that he might be the Lama, they spread out a blanket and placed on it personal items of the Lama and an equal number of things that belonged to others. 
the baby was put on the blanket and they watched carefully to see which object would catch his attention. Well, sure enough, he picked up a couple of the llama's belongings and clung to them. At that moment, they rejoiced in the knowledge that they had found the new body of their llama. It, it was not an abstract thought. It was a living reality of their village and a crucial moment in maintaining the structure of life and religious practice. It reminded me of a conversation with an elderly Mongolian Lama who was at the Berkeley campus when I arrived to teach. He had been through the same process of reincarnation with the search and the discovery by the community. In his case, he described how his life changed when he was taken from his mother to the training monastery. It was a difficult journey for him. His teacher was an elderly man who had also been the major disciple of the former lamas. The task of teaching the young lama was his role in the process of reincarnation. Well, as he told me of his childhood training, <clears throat> he shared how difficult it had been. His mentor kept speaking to him of things that the former Lama had known before his death. When the young child couldn't answer questions about doctrine, his teacher would shout, remember, remember, you once knew this perfectly and you taught it to me. Well, when, when he was naughty, they would put him on the wall next to the gate of the monastery and passerbys threw things at him, demanding that he start to live like his former body. Reincarnation was a living reality and the whole community joined in the process of establishing their Lama to his former state of knowledge and behavior. Now Buddhist texts describe for us the process of reincarnation in some detail. This involves death and birth as crucial moments when the mechanism of reincarnation is in operation. Human experience prior to death is said to contain four, <laughs> five aspects, form, feeling, perception, mental formations, and consciousness. These five create the world that we experience. Now at death, the texts tell us, the fifth of the five, that is consciousness, separates from the other four. It is this consciousness that from moment to moment maintains continuity. Remove it, and the body will decay and cease to function. Well, there, there's a great deal of literature written by those who have experienced what they call near death. One way of looking at those events when life force is being lost is to frame them as the separation of consciousness from the body. Now, Buddhists have various opinions about what happens to consciousness at death. Some, mainly those of the Theravada tradition, believe that in death, consciousness separates from the aspects of human experience and in the very next instant, reincarnate in a new body by rebinding at the moment of fertilization 
when a sperm and an egg interact. The image is that consciousness leaves behind one embodiment and instantly finds a new formation of life in which to appear. <clears throat> now the next embodiment can be a variety of living forms, animal, insect, earthly spirits or heavenly beings. The possibilities are ranked as fortunate and unfortunate. Fortunate are those reincarnated in the bodies of gods and humans. And the opposite are those who find attachment to an animal formation or a being in the dark realm that we might call hell. Well, another widespread idea in Buddhism is that the time <clears throat> between death and re-embodiment takes 49 days. During those 49 days, consciousness just exists in momentary flickers, but is not affected by acquiring new karma during this intermediate state. Now, this latter one is the dominant position held in East Asia. The Buddhist literature makes the case that the mechanism of transmission of consciousness is the only tie between a past in the flesh embodiment and a present one that we are experiencing at this moment. The only thing that transmigrates from one life to another is not the body. It is consciousness. Now, many Buddhists have a fond belief that this present body, which I experience as myself, has had many past lives. However, from the Buddhist perspective, each moment of consciousness each moment of being in a body that I claim to be myself is just a series of momentary and ever-changing sequences. Now, I can prove that this present moment of my body is not identical to the body that existed yesterday. I've aged, I'm having a birthday, I've aged, I've gained weight or lost weight. Change is universal and powerful. So it's difficult in the face of such ideas to make the case that this present body is identical to a body that existed centuries ago. So if reincarnation is not the continuation of the body, but as a process tied to consciousness, how can this be described? Well, from what we now know of the moment when conception occurs in the womb, there is an all important transfer of information as the sperm pierces the egg. In my case, the DNA of my father and my mother came in contact 89 years ago and a new life system, which I think of as myself, was started. From that millisecond event, the DNA sequence, which is still being replicated in every cell of my body, resulted from the transfer of information. And it has since controlled my every development, instincts, process of maturation, structure and function of my brain and body. Scientifically, we explain this as the continuity of DNA genetics. 
Our genes, which come from both egg and sperm, have the blueprint for all of human development. We are not born as a blank slate in the eyes of Buddhism. We carry in our body the memory of the ages. And so understanding reincarnation comes down to the question of how information transfers occur. After a period of time when consciousness was hardly ever mentioned by scholars, we now live in a time when it is a major topic for psychology, philosophy, sociology, computer science, and even physics. As a result of this multifaceted group of researchers, differences of opinion abound and some of the disagreements are fierce. If we take the discussion of reincarnation over to consciousness, it is not making it a simpler task. Rather, we're moving into a very complex realm of discourse. As a result, the debates between differing theories, there are schools of thought that have emerged. It is impossible to say which of the current definitions of consciousness and its functions will ultimately dominate. Now the battles between groups of scholars has become so fierce and so divided that the Templeton Foundation has set aside $20 billion to do a three-year project. Their procedure is to take what they consider to be the two most promising approaches and have the scholars supporting them join in a dialogue for three years. At the end of the three years, they will hope to have a unified view of consciousness. Well, I'm sure the debate and research of so many scholars will be of value. However, I am dubious that such an approach will lead to agreement between contesting points of view it is just as likely to result in multiple definitions, many more than we now have. So can Buddhism provide any insights for understanding or defining consciousness? The Sanskrit word we translate as consciousness is vijnana. It's a word having the root of Nya, J-N-A, which is the equivalent to the root for the English word, no. For the present, we can, can consider knowing as possession of information. Now, there are many ways to possess information. One is the result of sense organs receiving information that leads to knowledge. My eye receives the reflected light, <clears throat> transmit the impulse into an electrical current that rushes down the optic nerve to the brain where it undergoes further change and some chemical reactions. When this happens, I have an experience of seeing that is, in Buddhist thought, the vijnana, consciousness, that results from the sense organ receiving data and my brain producing the experience related to that event. Whether it's seeing an object, hearing a sound, or tasting an apple. In order to understand consciousness, that the Buddha said is the agent of reincarnation, 
I have come to wonder if we have to look beyond this sensory process. Perhaps it would be better to say that the process that survives and is transferred over time in reincarnation is information. And not all information is sensory. For example, at the present, the US is finishing the construction of the world's largest space telescope, named after the scientist James Webb. It will have the capacity to capture light that started its journey more than 13 billion years ago. When one result of the Big Bang was the appearance of light after some period of dust and darkness. What's so amazing is the fact that those long ago light particles still contain the memory of the history of our universe. From these particles of light, we can construct the images of objects that once existed and have long ago disappeared, except for the memory in the reflections that are still streaming out into space. Isn't it remarkable that the present photons of light rays contain 13 billion years of information? This information of ancient light is beyond my sensory capacity until the telescope captures it and transforms it into imagery, which our eyes can reflect to the brain. And I can find a picture of countless objects of the universe using my internet browser. That's why I said that not all information is sensory. It is not only the light of the universe that contains ancient information, our bodies also contain information that can be used to reconstruct the history of humanity. It is like the light of the cosmos. It's not sensory until we observe it. I'm here speaking of DNA, that along with the messenger RNA are the force behind all the functioning cells in our body. So just as light that carries information from the dawn of our universe, our body with DNA has information that shows the dawn of our genetic heritage. Now, before we had DNA information, the only avenue for knowing about ancient humans was archaeology. We were limited to dating fragments of objects that lay beneath the surface of the earth. Well, now information, memory, if you will, can take us back through the ages, and that includes the changes that have occurred through mutations of DNA. This, this is a new way of looking at our human condition. It's all relatively new. It's still not completely understood. However, from this type of research, we know that our ancestors included Neanderthals as well as Dinosaurians. It's even suggested that diabetes first arose among Neanderthals. So the history of how we reached this point in our understanding of the human genome is not very, very long. In 1945, it was noted that a cellular transformation 
could occur using an extract from cells that had been killed by heat. How could, how could functional information survive death? The answer to these queries have transformed our view and understanding of how life works. DNA was only discovered in 1951. And the structure of DNA as a double helix came in 1953. And genetic code in 1961. And the sequence of units of nucleic acid in 1977. And a complete construction of the genome sequences for the human only occurred in 2003. Of surprise, is the re of, the re of surprise is the research informing us that 95% of the human genome consists of DNA sequences that are not being used as far as we can detect. It's thought that a million or two billion years ago, they were used. What is not so clear is why these particular sequences are still preserved intact, passed along to every living being. But we're at the dawn of the DNA era and can expect many more discoveries in the decades to come. The revolution or the understanding of our humanness calls into question much of what we have thought in the past. It's, it's not beyond reason to consider my body as a reincarnation of data that goes back hundreds of thousands of years. Just like the light captured by our telescopes is a reincarnation of data that happened billions of years ago. So what happens to our consciousness when it disengages from the other aspects of life experience? Does it just disappear? Physics is coming up with some startling suggestions. It was once thought that information in the form of light is being sucked into black holes from which it can never reemerge. However, it's now known that a black hole contains information and eventually radiates it in the sequences that were sucked into the space that held antimatter. So the fact that a black hole can return information that has survived this harshest of tests tells us that information sequencing is a tough old bird. Now, I know you didn't expect a science lesson, <laughs> and certainly not from someone as ill-informed as myself. What I'm trying to discover is whether the idea of reincarnation has a place within our contemporary urban world with all the recent discoveries of how life replicates and how information is transferred over eons of time. I make no claim that I have been successful in this ambitious attempt. Let me say that our universe and our body both reflect information that is tied to events long past. Our very moment, our, our, our birth, our very birth is a, is a moment when ancient information is transferred to a cellular structure that will result in our body, our brain, our senses. Now we live in an age when it is crucial 
to understand how continuity of information happens. When I discuss some of these ideas with others, I have to tell you that I've gotten some very blank, <laughs> blank looks. Does it truly affect our daily lives to know about information being incarnated, being embodied over millions of years when it cannot be apprehended directly? What good can come to us by information that has been mediated through labs and telescopes? Is it true that we have no experience of DNA? Well, for myself, I have a daily experience of numb feet and a loss of balance and walking. It has been inherited from my mother's genetic heritage. So I'm, I may not be able to see DNA, but I certainly have an experience of how the information it carries is expressed in my daily life. There's no current treatment or cure for my condition. I share my genetic data with university researchers, hoping that advances will be made that can help unborn descendants overcome the malady. Don't we live with the effects of DNA even if we don't see it? The reincarnated information that makes up my body presents itself to me every moment. My facial features in the mirror resembling my great grandfather's face, my thinking process structured through the way my brain has developed from DNA, can I change my body by, by knowing that I have a specific kind of body? Well, I've, I've said before in these talks, the Buddhists have maintained that knowing things as they really are is at the heart of moving toward enlightenment. Living life can be compared to a, a car, car racing. Survival often depends on how well the driver knows the structure and the makeup of the car, knows the potential and also the limitations. I feel that the answer to the question of whether it makes a difference from our lives to know about things that seem remote and invisible is a loud affirmative. It is nothing less than a life of death matter. During COVID pandemic, people have struggled to control and interpret the microbe. But it, like ourselves, has a structure and the way in which it infects and spreads and mutates is in keeping with that blueprint. It is this blueprint of information reincarnating, perhaps for centuries, that has given us a chance to manufacture a vaccine for this microbe. For some, the belief in reincarnation is based on faith and an acceptance that does not need science. For others, the disbelief in reincarnation is also based on faith. What I've tried to do in this talk is to explore the idea that information transfer over centuries is real and is reincarnated in bodily functions. And so, I think of myself and all of you as reincarnations. Thank you. Thank you, Lou, uh, for an outstanding and touching lecture on reincarnation. It is full of 
uh, new information. We really need another course for this topic. And uh, so we, we're gonna take some questions now. Uh, please write uh, your questions in the chat box. And I will take my, uh, I, I would like to ask my question. One question first and before taking another question. Uh, each time uh, somebody, someone reincarnate on earth as a human, it loses all memory of the real world right? and memories of its past lives on earth. Is this necessary in order to start again from zero or acquire a new personality? Why human beings lose memory of past life? Is it because of our karma or something else? Is it like? <laughs> well, I, I just remember, um, and of course, this, these are questions that are asked of the Dalai Lama all the time. And he said, I, I don't remember. I don't, I don't have that memory of my former body. I don't know why my former body of the former Dalai Lama loved horses. I have nothing to do with horses. I couldn't care less about horses. Why is that? I don't know. I have no memory of such a love of horses. So it's not so much memory in, in that sense of a consciousness memory. To me, I'm looking at it as going to try to find out how information as such is transferred. That's, that's all I've tried to do with this lecture. But thank you for your question. That's a good one. I can't answer it. Thank you. Uh, so we'll take some questions from the audience. The first question from Tom Monjo. Is it possible that the reincarnated Lama might have a DNA similar to the DNA of the previous Lama? and not just perhaps the transfer of knowledge. Have any study, studies been conducted on DNA, a similar DNA, re-DNA similarities? Well, you know, um, the DNA structure which, which we look at reflects information from thousands of years ago. That information shows itself in the spikes and the arrangement of the DNA. So again, I think that um, the DNA between all of us, all of us watching this right now, the DNA difference between us is just barely 2%. It's identical DNA. 98% of our DNA is identical. And so it is with every person on this earth. It's just this tiny little bit of DNA, 2%, where our individuality or our own self begins to appear. So I think that um, the, the question about former DNA, that, that's basically what DNA research is all about, is to be able to take the sequencing and figure out how far back can we reconstruct the sequencing. And it's, it's rather amazing at how or back you can go. But I, I don't say that this answers all the questions. And it certainly is just one small way of looking at the issue. Thank you. A second question. What uh, from robot one, what is the difference between reincarnation versus rebirth? Well, reincarnation means uh, incarnation means to put something into flesh. That's what it means. It becomes flesh. 
So what is it that happens when the sperm and the egg come together and a consciousness is created in that flesh? Is that rebirth? <clears throat> well, it's not rebirth in the sense of identical state of what was there before. But it says that the process of returning information to a fleshly form, which is my body, we understand a little bit about that now. We understand how that happens and how DNA passes it along. But remember, we've only known about DNA since 1950. It's new material compared to much of what we know about the world. It'll take us a while. So reincarnation and rebirth from one perspective, they are just different terms for the same issue. But from another, uh, reincarnation of putting things into the flesh does not say that it's the same thing that was there before. And I worry that rebirth gives the idea that uh, this body of mine just gets reborn but I don't feel that if you read the Buddhist texts in, in detail, that that's what they said. I, I think they were saying that whatever is reincarnated, put into flesh, while it's old data, it's a lot of information. It's the whole past information of ourselves and, and what's happened to us but it's, it's not identical to a body that was present in the past. That's just my read of the text. And as I've said, there are many people who have a really strong feeling that they are, this body is a rebirth. And I don't mean to, I, don't, I can't tell you that it's right or wrong. I'm not interested in trying to do that. What I'm interested in trying to do is to explore how can Buddhists begin to speak to an urban population, which is what the world has become, with all sorts of information about DNA and universal light and all of these things. Can Buddhism continue to speak to this generation and offer them something. And I think that's that's the question that is before us. Uh, next next question from Professor Changu. Is free will part of consciousness? Will the incarnation of information affect human beings' ability to make their own decision? Yeah, free will. <laughs> yes, Jung, that's a good question. I thank you for it. And I, I don't have a really good answer because as you know, people have been battling about free will for generations and centuries. Um, I, I think that none of us can say, I'm completely free of any of the past. I somehow have separated myself from all other humans and all other animals and all other things. And I can be completely in control and my, my will is what will dominate. But you know, um, this transfer of, of information says we are all influenced from the past. Yeah. We're never free of it. 
the very structure of my brain comes from the past and is the way in which it just happens to come together. And so when I use free will of my brain, it's a little bit like I was talking about a car race. It's like saying, this is my car, as if it just came into existence right this moment. And I have complete control of my car and we use my car. Or I stand at a bus stop and I say, I'm waiting for my bus, as if there is no other entity except for, for my ego with, with these issues. So yeah, we can, we can make decisions, no question about it. But when I look back at my decisions, I see there's a pattern in the way in which I've made decisions through the years. It's not always a pattern that, that makes me feel good, but there is a pattern there. And where did that pattern come from? What made me fearful of some things and fearless in other things? So making our decisions, we have to realize that the structure which we have determines even though we think we're making, I think I'm making a decision. And yet um, there are some times when I feel like all of my ancestors who are passed on are just standing behind me. They're with me in my very body. I, I contain their DNA. And I can't just ignore that. So I think this does, uh, John, it, uh, it does have a lot to do with uh, how we deal with the idea of our will and our intention and everything that we do, when is it our personal thing? And when it is, when is it something which has such a long past to it that we can't say that we do something totally separated from the past? But thanks. Good to see you. Thank you. Next question from Chuck. Polly, how do we, how do, do you see our knowledge of reincarnation helping us to assess functional information to help ease the human dilemma? Looking at long-term continuity and community memory. Thank you, Chuck. I'm happy to have you on the program. Um, <clears throat> As I said, the Buddhists say that the start of enlightenment is to see things as they really are. And so it, I think we have to really try to understand what is it that we know about the way things really are. And that that is one of the ways in which we deal with life. Um, some years ago, I, I had a strange health issue. I got pneumonia every two weeks. I go to the doctor, they give me an antibiotic, pat me on the head and send me home. And two weeks, I'd be right back. I had pneumonia again, wheezing like a I finally found this wonderful, wonderful woman doctor who said, don't you take another single prescription until somebody has made a diagnosis of what's wrong with you. Something is wrong with you. And don't let them give you drugs if they don't know what's wrong with you. And she put me through a series of tests and sent 
my stuff all over the country for people to explore. And finally, finally, one day she called me and she said, we found it. You have a, a fungus. And I've just used DNA to determine exactly which fungus you have. And here's the drug you take. You take this for six months. <laughs> My eyes rose from that. You take this for six months and you'll be well. And I was. She saved my life. Why did she save my life? It was because she said, we need to know the way things really are before we treat you. If we just say, oh, I'm going to use a template that says, you have an infection, I'm gonna give you this. I don't know what your infection is, I don't care. I'm just gonna give you this drug. So the, the, the Buddha said when he was, people described him as a physician and they described his teaching as medicine. But the big issue always was that he had to determine what medicine was needed by his audience. He didn't give everybody the same teaching. So Chuck, when you say, how about having access to information? How does it help us in our daily life? It is, as I said, a, a life or death matter to try to determine what it is that's happening to us. And <clears throat> part of what is happening to us is that our bodies and our minds are functioning with information which has come to us from far, far away and long, long ago. And somehow we have to come to grips with that. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, we have five more questions, but I think just take a few, right? Okay, uh, next question from Danny Tam. Uh, teaches non-self. So who is the I reincarnated actually? Does consciousness equal I? What is the true self? There was a chant saying, a man walked across the breeze above the water. He discovered that in reality, the breeze is flowing, but not the water. Just... Um. If you may, I'm going to ask your permission to take a pass on this question because next time I believe my next lecture is on the self. So will you let me try to explain the self as I understand it in a more complex way next time? Next question from Vande Pema Ratana. Information in DNA may correspond to Rupa in the five aggregate. How can we understand the transfer of information stored in other aggregates to another life? Rupa does not transmigrate in the Buddhist tradition, only Vijnana. So if DNA is Rupa only, it wouldn't be passing on according to the Buddhist tradition. So basically, I take DNA to be much closer to Vijnana information. It's a reincarnation of information that gets passed along from one body to another. So in that sense, I would not uh, have identified DNA as Rupa. It, of course reincarnates and the moment it reincarnates that that means in the buddhist sense that all the aspects of life recombine and one of those is form so the information does reincarnate in the flesh in form yes but when it's transmigrating from one 
in that aspect of itself, it doesn't do it as a material form. I hope that answers. Thank you, Luke. The next question from Noah. Is it possible that reincarnation happens only as a form of consciousness descending within lineage? In other words, do you think it is possible that if a person has no offspring in their lifetime, then they are not subject to any form of reincarnation? Or do you think that consciousness can transfer from one DNA lineage to another? Long. Well, that's why I, I spoke tonight about two, two specific forms of information transfer. One was light and the other was DNA. Those are just two, th two out of many. Do I think that because somebody is childless that their consciousness ends? Um, I have no proof that that's the case, that their consciousness is any different than mine because I have two children. How do we pass on information? We are just now trying to figure it out. And, and does, if we think of the transfer as only physical, it's, it, even though I've described the egg and the, and the sperm, and you would say, well, that's physical. Yes, it is. But at that moment of transfer, where does the, what is the information? Is it physical? Or is the information being reincarnated, refleshing itself at that moment of transfer? Where was it before? What was it? So if the if the very light that I see carries the history of the universe, I'm not too worried about the information disappearing because somebody doesn't pass on their DNA. It's, it's out there. Information is, un, un, it's, it's a mystery still to me. Okay. The next question from one Jane Ting. Why does the bird not begin at name and form? in the 12 link of dependent origination, but later. What does Buddha support equality or equity? Well, name and form um, is another way of saying body and mind. Name is like the body. Naming is, is a mental process. So the most ancient form of, of the Buddhist idea is name and form. This became the five that I talk about, the five skandhas, developed from this. Name was just needed to be expanded. And so it became four different things, including consciousness. I think that over time, Buddhism was struggling with all these issues. These are important and, and very difficult issues. Now, when I have consciousness, how do you research it? See, that's one of the big problems. My consciousness is personal to me. Nobody can see it. Nobody can measure it yet, as far as I know. So the Buddhists were dealing with this internal experience and they were really trying to observe how information gets passed along. And they spent centuries at it. So in that sense, uh, the 12 links of dependent origination is another way of talking about the way in which things are passed on. But there is, at the same time, momentariness. Nothing lasts, everything changes. 
And the change means a kind of doctrine of emptiness. I believe, Morose, that it's our time. Okay. I really like to hold to the time because I know that it's late for people. So uh, sorry about so we have run out of time. So and uh, so I would like to thank Lou for a great talk, and I hope all can join next lecture on compassion on Tuesday, November 23rd at 7 p.m. I'm, uh, I'm also happy to announce that tomorrow at 11, on the occasion of the 89th birthday of Dr. Lancaster, uh, we are launching our rare Sanskrit Buddhist manuscript preservation project website of University West. I hope you all can join. And at, at last, I would like to thank Professor Ta, Dr. Iba Mura, Dr. James Renke, Christopher Johnson, Venable D. Hong, Venable Srinanda, and Fong Sam for their support. And thank you everyone for attending and have a good night. <laughs>